much and, and thank you ah brilliant so thank you all for um uh, joining tonight now there may be some people who join a little bit later uh, as taylor said my name is simon grummet i'm a medical oncologist uh based in the west midlands um, i've worked for many years in wolverhampton uh, i now presently work at the queen elizabeth hospital in birmingham i trained in the west midlands as well um, and I'm going to talk about three different things this evening, and I'm going to take probably about 30 to 40 minutes to talk, and then I'm very happy to take any questions at the end. I'm going to talk a little bit about the shape of medical uh, and clinical oncology training, because they're very tightly linked together, uh, and, and what you would expect is in a, during your time as a trainee in, uh, in an oncological specialty. I'm then going to talk a little bit about uh, an innovation and change that I have seen whilst I've been a consultant that just to me demonstrates um, how exciting and, and rewarding oncology can be. And then I'll finish by just talking you through my career path and my experience um, as, um, an, um, as a medical oncologist and how my career pans out and what my typical week is like and ask questions at the end. So the first few slides are based on a, a presentation that I have done uh, recently to both Bir Birmingham University and Aston University students um, about the, um, the training uh, and these are joint slides from the Royal College of Radiologists and the, and, uh, the Royal College of Physicians. So oncology is a specialty based on teamwork. It's, you, you work very closely with a large group of people and that's one of the very enjoyable things about it. It's also very intellectually rewarding. Um, so you work closely with the radiotherapy teams, you work with the specialist nursing teams, palliative care, there's a great degree of research in it, uh, you'll, you know, obviously dabble in systemic therapies, uh, and, and, um, and you work across multiple teams within um, uh, within the hospital. You know, I tend to work with both the plastic surgery teams in my melanoma practice uh, and dermatology teams, and I work with the uh, urology teams in my kidney cancer and testicular cancer practice. Um, it's very patient-centered. One of the things that I love about it is the fact you get to know your patients really well, and you have a real opportunity to uh, uh, get to know your patients well, in, which isn't always the case in medical specialties. There's a difference between radiotherapy and systemic therapy. So medical oncologists like myself, we specialize in systemic therapies. So these are cytotoxic chemotherapies, immunotherapies, monoclonal antibodies, targeted agents. Um, often we're quite research active. Uh, we put a lot of people into clinical trials. Uh, we, we, we push the, the boundaries of um, personalized medicine. Um, Radiotherapy, which is primarily what clinical oncologists train in, uh, is, is very technologically advanced treatment using um, ionizing, non-ionizing radiation uh, to treat tumors. Um, it's a hands-on skill. Um, you've got to like your physics. Um, you've got to like your, your technology um, to, to go into that. And, and this poses an immediate question, which is how on earth can you know whether you want to be a medical oncologist or a clinical oncologist at such an early stage in your medical training? And for many years, you had to make that decision quite early. Uh, but actually, we've come to realize that there are lots of people who might be better in one area of the specialty or the other um, and don't necessarily know that when they first start training. They just know they want to be an oncologist. Um, so as a result, we've brought together medical and clinical oncology training. And so what would happen now if you wanted to be an oncologist is you would go through your foundation years, uh, your first two, two years of uh, hospital medicine. Uh, you would then enter into internal medicine and you do two years as an internal medicine, uh, effectively what used to be known as an S medical SHO. Um, you then go through national recruitment, which has just happened in oncology. The interviews were last week for the next year. And then if you're selected, into either medical or clinical oncology, you go into what's called a, a common STEM year. So you spend your first year as a specialist registrar uh, as a kind of pluripotent oncologist. Uh, and so you will get experience in radiotherapy, in uh, systemic agents, in acute oncology, in research, and in some tumor sites and MDT working and, and all of the other aspects of oncology. So that at the end of that year, uh, if you want to, you can switch between medical and clinical oncology. You then enter into your, your specialist training, which for medical oncology would be a further three years, for clinical oncology a further four years to allow for the, the learning of the extra techniques in radiotherapy. Um, lots of people take uh, higher degrees during 
oncology training. I, I did a PhD during my medical oncology training, but you don't have to. Uh, it, it's purely because it's a very research active uh, area, but uh, there are lots and lots of oncologists I work with who are really very, very good, who haven't done any form of higher degree beyond what they did at medical school. So if oncology appeals to you as a medical student, and the fact that you're all here at quarter past six on a um, uh, Tuesday evening suggests to me that you probably have some interest in, in oncology, then what, how can you get involved and how can you fill up your CV with stuff that's going to look good when you come to your shortlisting for oncology type posts? Well, both the Royal College of Radiologists who sponsor clinical oncology and the ACP, which is the, stands for the Association of Cancer Physicians, which is a kind of uh, a separate subcommittee within the within the Royal College of Physicians have oncology undergraduate bursaries and prizes. And they have lots of information on their websites um, about how you can get involved as a medical student. Um, you might want to do your elective in, in oncology. Uh, you might want to do audits with an oncology focus uh, and you can join an oncology society such as Bonus, which obviously you're all members of, but there are other societies either local or um, regional uh, around the country. But the best thing you can do is when you're on your placements, just come and speak to, to an onco friendly oncologist. And most of us are friendly. Um, contact us. We're always happy to speak to medical students. We've always got audit projects and things that you can help us with. And we're always happy to kind of try and show you what uh, an enjoyable specialty it is. So, so just contact us. And I'll leave my contact details on the final slide. So if any of you want to get in touch with me um, or um, you know, I'm more than happy for you to do that. So before I talk any more, I'm going to talk a little bit about how things have changed just in the short time that I've been a consultant. And I'm going to use melanoma as an example. So melanoma, as, as you may know, is a, um, a, a tumour of pigme uh, malignancy of pigmented cells. It's associated with intense bursts of UV light exposure. It's common in people with type one and type two Caucasian skins, although any ethnic group can get melanoma. And in the Western world, it is rising faster in incidence faster than any other cancer. When I started as a consultant back in 2005, and I took on a melanoma practice, the only drug we had to use was a drug called decarbazine, which was an alkylating agent, old, good old fashioned cytotoxic chemotherapy. And decarbazine, which is also known as DTIC on this Kaplan-Meier curve that you can see, was not very effective. And what you can see from this graph, if you, if you understand the Kaplan-Meier survival plot, you'll know we talk about median overall survival. That's the point at which 50% of the patients have had their event. Uh, and if you trace that on this graph, you hit median overall survival around about seven months. So at this point, if you had metastatic melanoma, your average survival was about seven months. A small number of patients lived to a year and about 10% of patients got beyond two years. It was a rapidly lethal cancer um, and it was difficult to treat. And for many years, I used carbazine to treat these patients with very poor outcomes. And I used to put a lot of patients into clinical trials. And then one of the clinical trials I put patients into, which was for a novel form of immunotherapy, suddenly seemed to be showing some responses. And this was a trial that ran in the late 2000s, between about 2008 and 2010. And then when this trial was reported, there was a survival advantage associated with this new drug, a, dr a type of immunotherapy agent called ipilimumab. And one of the things about oncology is that drugs are really difficult to pronounce. Uh, I have to practice before I mention them to the patients. So immunotherapy dramatically changed things. And if we look at the next, um, sorry, if we look at the next slide, we can see that this is data that's come out very recently uh, from, from that trial that we were involved with. And what we can see is if you look on the top line, this is patients who received what's called combination immunotherapy. So this is drugs that block the immune system in two distinct places you can see that overall survival, median overall survival, has improved from approximately seven months to approximately six and a half years. And this change occurred over about a four-year period. And I went from my melanoma patients pretty much all dying within a year and it being a dis terribly distressing clinic to run to having patients who are living for six years, seven years, 10 years, 
Um, and I now have a cohort of patients whom I have treated who presented with metastatic disease, who if I treated in 2005, would all have died by now, who have got long-term control over their disease, who are out at five years to 10 years with, with very well-controlled disease. And so what this demonstrates is that it, oncology is a specialty that rapidly changes. I think there are very few specialties you can work in where outcomes for patients undergo such dramatic changes. Now, this is an exception or, or exceptional results, but we've seen similar things in kidney cancer. We've seen similar changes in my lifetime in oncology, in breast cancer, in lung cancer, um, so and, and even to a certain degree in colorectal cancer. So oncology is constantly changing. You have to read lots. You have to attend the conferences. You can't just stand still or you will rapidly get out of date. And to me, you know, quite a long way into my consultant career, that's one of the things that keeps it exciting and keeps it interesting. Um, because, you know, changes like this are, are remarkable. And, and when I sit down with patients now in my, in my melanoma clinics, and they're enormously busy because I've got all these patients who are living for many years, and I don't mind that. I don't mind the fact that my clinics are, are overwhelming. It's because patients are doing so well. So that's a little bit about you know, the real positives we see in, in um, oncology. But what about me? So I started back in 1987. I did a mathematics degree because it's what I was good at at school. And I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life other than go to university and have fun. And so I did for three years and didn't write any essays at all. Um, but I got to the end of that and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I, I, I briefly worked as an accountant and I hadn't enjoyed it. And then I, I'd worked as a nurse and I thoroughly enjoyed working as a nurse. Um, and on one of the night shifts, I remember the sister saying to me, you know, have you ever thought of being a doctor? You're quite good with patients. And you're quite clever. And, and I'd never thought of being a doctor ever. Um, but there I was at the age of 20 in my final year of my maths degree. And I suddenly thought, maybe I could do medicine. And back in those days, it was very unusual to do medicine as a second degree. It's much more common now. And it was actually incredibly difficult to get onto a second degree course. Uh, I had to have all sorts of financial guarantees and I had to get a very good grade in my, my maths degree. Uh, but I did manage to get onto the medicine course at Birmingham, which was one of the few universities at that stage that would uh, accept um, postgraduate students. Um, and um, uh, so I did my medicine degree. I then did some pre-registration house jobs in the West Midlands and uh, in North Staffordshire. And then I went on to a medical rotation uh, and I worked at various hospitals uh, in and around the West Midlands, City Hospital, Kidderminster General and Birmingham Heartlands. And I quite enjoyed medicine, but I never really felt I wanted to be an acute medic. I, I, and, but then in at Heartlands, around about the time I passed my MRCP exam, I did a medical oncology attachment just as part of my rotation. Never really thought of oncology before, but there was something about that three month attachment and the patients and just the, the relationship you could build with the patients. Um, and I fell in love with oncology and I applied for a training number um, and was lucky enough uh, to get a, a post uh, here at the Queen Elizabeth in Birmingham, where I did two years as, as a clinical research fellow, which was effectively doing clinics and, and, and as a registrar training. Um, and I, I really got the hang of oncology in those first two years um, and, and thoroughly enjoyed it. I then went off to do a PhD. I spent three years doing an MRC funded PhD, and this was into mathematical modeling in, um, in oncology based on my previous maths degree. Um, I went into my PhD thinking that I was going to be an academic and publish loads of papers um, and be some kind of um, professor running, running a, a basic research institute. But actually what I learned really quickly in my PhD was that I wasn't terribly good at all that sort of stuff. Uh, I particularly wasn't very good at writing papers. Um, and whilst I got my PhD, I really, really missed the clinical work. And I started doing a clinic a week um, during later, laterally in my PhD just to keep my clinical skills up. And then I was really keen and, and, look, and excited to get back to my clinical work. So I'm glad I did it because it absolutely demonstrated to me that it wasn't the thing for me to be doing long term. But if I hadn't done it, I would always have had that thought of, you know, should I have done research? So I would always say, take your opportunities. I would always say, if you are offered a, um, 
you know, a, a, an opportunity like a higher degree or some form of research, always embrace it and make the most of it because you will, even if it's not the right thing for you, you will learn something about yourself and you'll learn something important. And for me, it was I'm rubbish at writing papers. So in 2003, I went back onto the training rotation. I had another couple of years to do to finish my training, um, which I did in 2005. By then, I'd covered all the major tumor types. Um, I'd, I'd actually pretty much finished writing up my PhD as well. Um, and I'd completed my training. Um, and so I, I looked for a consultant job at that point. I got a job in Wolverhampton, um, which was a small cancer center uh, with its own radiotherapy department. About There was about 12, 13 consultants there when I started. So it's not a huge center like here in Birmingham or somewhere like the Marsden or the Christie. Um, but it was it was friendly. It was a nice hospital. Uh, and I worked there for 15 years in my time there. Um, once I'd established myself as a consultant, I was given some very good advice when I started, which was, you know, for the first couple of years, keep your head down. Don't volunteer for anything and just get yourself established. But eventually opportunities come your way. Um, and against my greater wisdom, really. Um, I ended up becoming clinical director in 2013, which meant I, I was in charge of the department. I ran the department, did that for three years, which was very challenging. Um, I had no training in medical management, um, but it was, again, one of those opportunities that I thought I would take. Um, and again, I learned a lot about myself. I turned out I was quite a good leader and manager of people. I was quite good at getting the best out of my colleagues um, and it was um, ultimately a very enjoyable three years, albeit exhausting, because you carried on doing your clinical work as well. Um, in 2016, I stood down as that and I took on the role as lead cancer clinician. Uh, and this meant I was responsible for the cancer performance and cancer pathways, not just of the trust, but of the whole region, what's known as the Black Country region, which is Wolverhampton, Dudley and, and um, Walsall. Uh, again, really interesting, a more strategic role. I was involved in you know, planning how the next five years of cancer services would look in the in the, the department. Um, and I that was a three year tenure. So I stepped down in 2019, which was just before COVID hit. Um, and then in 2020, I was offered a job over here in Birmingham. Um, and I've taken on this job, which is predominantly uh, the lead for kidney cancer. Uh, but also I do some melanoma and some testicular cancer. And I'm about to take on the role as the trainee program director, uh, which will be a five year post, uh, which means I will be responsible for the whole West Midlands um, training program for medical oncology. So making sure all the various posts are appropriate for training and that everybody gets the right support and all that sort of thing. So as you can see, the common theme is that you do your clinical work and you have to enjoy your clinical work. And, you know, I've just finished a testicular cancer clinic this afternoon, seeing, you know, a bunch of new patients, young lads have been diagnosed with testicular cancer, offering them generally curative chemotherapy. And, and oncology, you know, I've always enjoyed the, the, the basic clinical work, but you need something else to do. You need another string to your bow. Um, and because of that, you know, I've always taken on other responsibilities as I've as I've gone on, um, because I think it's important and, and you should always I would always say seize your opportunities. So what's my typical week like now at this stage of my career? Well, I'm a relatively senior consultant, um, but I still have five outpatient clinics a week. So in each of those, I'll typically see anything from. 12 to 16 patients, a mixture of new and follow ups. I'll often have a registrar working with me or a prescribing pharmacist or something, and they'll have their own list of patients. I do two ward rounds a week. One is just of my own patients um, who happen to be inpatients. The other one is what's called an acute oncology ward round. So I see all the new oncology related admissions from the last 24 hours. Uh, and that's quite interesting because I get to see tumor sites that I don't normally treat. Um, and, and I go around with the junior doctors and there's a lot of opportunity for teaching on that ward round. I have three MDT meetings. So these are multidisciplinary meetings and I'm sure lots of you would have ended up going to these. From a medical student point of view, they're fairly dull, um, but from, an, from a consultant point of view, they're important. And it's where we plan the treatment for our patients. And I attend two urology uh, and one skin cancer MDT per week. Uh, one, of, one of them is uh, in person and the other two are done remotely. But as I said, there are other things. And one of the, the things I like about oncology is the fact that there is a, 
wide range of opportunities for other things to do. You have your core clinical work, and for some people, that's all they do. But generally speaking, you're likely to get a bit bored if that's the only thing you do, and you may start to lose your enthusiasm for it over the years. So it's important that you take on some additional roles. And to be honest, your, your trust that you work in will want you to take on some additional roles. So teaching, um, uh, clinical administration and, and continuous professional development, everybody has to do it, you know, obviously part of the job, as is audit and appraisal. But other things that people do, educational supervision and mentoring, which is something I do a lot of looking after the registrars and, and teaching the medical students. A lot of people are very active in research. Early in my career, I was I was very active, put lots of patients into clinical trials. I don't do that quite so much now. Um, if you are a clinical oncologist, you will spend time doing radiotherapy planning, which is a fascinating technical um, demanding um, process. Uh, using you know the, the latest computer programming uh, power and, and a lot of knowledge of physics um, and some people will do private practice um, and there's a lot of private practice in medicine and if, in oncology and if that's the sort of thing that drives you then again that's a, a specialty uh, that is um, that is good so finishing off with what do I enjoy about my job well first and foremost it's patient contact I like patients. I always have done. Um, I like forming relationships with them. I like looking after them um, and building a rapport with them. And oncology gives you the opportunity to do that over months and, and sometimes years, particularly as our treatments get better. You know, we follow up our testicular cancer patients for five years. My melanoma patients, I've got patients out at seven, eight, ten years. So you've got to like people. You've got to like patients. It's a very um, humanitarian type specialty. Um, there's also enormous variety. So every patient's different, every, and, and every interaction of the patient and their social environment and, and their tumor and their treatment is different. Um, and particularly in my present job, I'm very lucky. I tend to see the, the very complicated and specialized kidney cancer stuff. And so, you know, I never quite know what's going to come through the door, but there's huge variety. I did a, uh, a careers day at, at Aston University recently and we had a stand myself and one of my clinical oncology colleagues and a question we got asked by a lot of the uh, medical students who came to visit us was do you not get bored after you've been doing the same thing for 10 years does it not become dull and boring but I can honestly say it doesn't because the patients are all different and uh, uh, and, and every day some new disaster normally befalls you um, you're on the cutting edge in oncology that's very true um, as I demonstrated with the, the improvements we've seen with immunotherapy, uh, that the new techniques in radiotherapy, the new approaches, new surgical approaches, there's always something new happening and, and you feel like you are, you are right there. You know, and we tend to be, particularly in, in medical oncology, but it's true for clinical oncology as well, we tend to be very early adopters of new technologies. You know, so when new drugs come out, we tend to either try and get them through clinical trials or through expanded access programs, new technologies, so that we can get the, these treatments to our patients as early as possible. You work in multiple teams. I work with urologists. I work with specialist nurses, chemotherapy nurses, clinical and medical oncology colleagues. I work with plastic surgeons and dermatologists. I work with palliative care doctors. Um, and when patients get wild and wacky side effects from their immunotherapy, um, then I tend to find myself working with gastroenterologists and endocrinologists and, and neurologists. So um, you, you, you have to be good at team working. You have to be good at communicating with your colleagues um, in a timely manner. Um, so it's, it's a good specialty for those who are good at communicating, both with patients and colleagues. Uh, research is um, ubiquitous in, in oncology. Um, and, you know, you will undoubtedly in any medical specialty take part in lots of clinical research, but, but you really will. There'll be lots of it around in oncology uh, and virtually everybody is research active to some degree or other. Not everybody teaches. I thoroughly enjoy teaching uh, and, and there's a, there's a, but, but the key thing really is you only want the people who enjoy it and are good at it to be teaching. And as medical students, you know this because the last people you want teaching you, people who don't really want to do it and are just doing it because they've been told to do it because that's a terrible experience. Um, so it's very important that you know, we select the right people to teach and we give them the space and time to be able to teach properly. And that can be very difficult because we're all so busy. Um, oncology allows for a flexible 
work-life balance. This is one of the things I thought about when I decided on doing oncology, you know, as a junior doctor in my late twenties, um, because I didn't want to be working one weekend in three, coming in in the middle of the night to do procedures or operations when I had young children, or even uh, when, as I do now, I have teenage and, and more grown up children, because I want to spend as much time at home as I can. I enjoy my job. I want to do my job well, but I want to have a healthy life outside of medicine. Um, and oncology allows for that. The on-call commitment is not massively onerous. I think in 15 years uh, at Wolverhampton, I had to come in out of hours once. Uh, and that was to talk to a very sick patient on ITU and their relatives. Um, so you don't have to come in very much. You're very busy and it's emotionally very demanding. Um, but, you know, I'm plenty and plenty of my colleagues work part time um, or, or less than full time. Uh, and again, it, and we've got some very successful job shares that, that work, consultants who cover the same patient group, but they each work kind of two and a half days a week. And that seems to work really well. Specialist opportunities, well, everybody, when you train as an oncologist, uh, as a junior doctor, as a registrar, you do everything. So you do all the tumor types. But once you become a consultant, you can start to specialize. And um, sometimes you end up in specialties because that's where the gaps are in the service that's required. But often you'll have a theme of something that you've always really enjoyed. And for me, it's been melanoma and kidney cancer that I've done all the way through my career. Um, and, you know, and, and have seen tremendous improvements in that. But you can become very highly specialised. You know, I have I have uh, colleagues who just work in one single tumour type um, and therefore, you know, become key opinion national and, and international key opinion leaders very quickly. And uh, if, if that's your sort of thing, then, then, you know, you can do that in oncology. But the key thing, and that's why I've put asterisks around it, is this emotional resilience. Oncology is undoubtedly an emotionally demanding specialty. You know, I see a lot of very distressing things. I see, um, uh, I, I witness a lot of uh, emotional and upsetting consultations uh, that often are very upsetting for the patient and their relatives and also very upsetting for me and the other clinic staff that I'm with. And so you, you will have to have, and this is true in any area of medicine, but very specifically for oncology, you will have to have some form of emotional safety valve. And whatever that is, whether it's your religious beliefs, whether it's your friendship group, whether it's your hobbies, whether it's playing a musical instrument or doing Ironman triathlons or whether it's, you know, whatever it is, as long as it's legal, um, you have to have something. And, and it's, it's really important that even at this early stage as medical students, you give some thought to that. You know, when I have those really hard days, I had a terrible clinic last Monday. Both my registrars were off. I had, I don't know, 30 patients, loads of bad news to break, really distressing consultations. And it's always the last two in the afternoon that are really distressing. And by then you're running an hour late. And I was in bits by the end of it. And so I needed to go away and kind of recompose myself. And, you know, I have my strategies for doing that, um, but everybody's is individual. And I would absolutely implore you to think about that before you hit being a junior doctor, because all of a sudden you'll be dead busy and you'll have no time to think about what works for you. So just think, you know, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna unwind healthily um, when it's all quite difficult? So that was me talking at you for 35 minutes. Um, uh, I hope you found it interesting. I'm very happy to answer any questions anybody has. Um, I'm equally very happy if people don't want to ask a question in front of uh, other people. And if people want to email me, there's my email address. It might take me a few days to get back to you, but I, but I always will. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to take any, any questions now about any aspect really of, of medical oncology as, as a career. Thank you very much, Dr. Gromit. That was a fantastic talk. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I think if anyone wants to pop any questions in the chat, um, I can um, read them out to Dr. Gromit. But um, until people do that, um, I will start off with a question. Um, so as you mentioned, um, that oncology is, you know, one of the most fast moving fields. Um, wh where do you think the most advancement is going to be made? Um, within the next few years? So, so that's a really, really good question. Um, I think the, certainly in the field of medical oncology, it's going to be personalized medicine. 
So we are already running a panel of molecular markers on patients when we see them, things like BRAF and ROS and EGFR and KRAS and NTRK. So lots of tests that we do just as routine on patients. And these give us a, a, a panel that allow us to choose the right treatment for the patient. Increasingly, we're, we're doing more widespread genomic testing on patients. So if I have a patient who's got very limited treatment options or has a really rare tumor and I don't know what to do with it, then what I tend to do is send off a, 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 you have to get funding for it, but I send off a full genomic profile on the patient in the hope that it will identify some mutations that may allow me to offer treatment. And these treatments are often through clinical trials. They often involve the patients having to travel, um, but still it opens up the, the options for them. And I think this is going to be the biggest, the, the move to fully personalized medicine in oncology, I think is going to be the biggest change that we'll see in the remainder of my career as a consultant and as the time that you guys are coming up to be junior doctors and consultants.